Welcome back. Um, in part one, we talked a little bit about the 1967 Hong Kong riots and the conditions that led, uh, led to them, as well as the actions of the Hong Kong communists in trying to organize and get people out on the streets. Now in part two, we're going to talk a little bit about the Hong Kong government's reaction and their response to, uh, to these communists' riots. As time passed into mid-July, it became clear that Hong Kong was not going to fall apart. The reasons were many. The heavy-handed moves from China, the Hong Kong communist attempts to make the shortages worse by calling for the fishermen and farmers to strike along with the industrial workers, news from the mainland about how things were happening over there, as well as the random Red Guard-like violence. It had all turned the public's opinion against what was happening, and a reverse boycott began against communist-run establishments, and those organizations began to lose money. The colonial secretary pushed to quote-unquote grass and retain the initiative in its confrontation with quote-unquote a small left-wing minority. The first police raids began on July 12th, and over the next two weeks, some 1,500 people were arrested. The police would get special emergency powers, left-wing newspapers and schools were shut down, and their leaders were deported back to the PRC. The communist extreme response lost them the city for good. They began to resort to violence. In August 24th, they set a popular Hong Kong radio commentator on fire. And then came the bombings, with some 8,074 fake bomb threats and 1,167 genuine bombings in public places like markets and restaurants and theaters. They turned from, you know, genuine revolutionaries to terrorists. And the public drastically turned against them and pushed the Hong Kong government to take a further stand. The bombings would eventually end by 1968, but not after the deaths of some 15 people and the injuries of many more. 51 people were killed in total throughout the entire 1967 riots, and there were millions of dollars of property damage. But in the end, the Hong Kong government and society prevailed. So what did the communists in Hong Kong do wrong? First, they forgot to approach the police themselves until it was too late. Without the support of the police, the British government could not have suppressed the riots. Attempts to organize and propagandize the police failed, as not one of the 10,000 policemen joined the agitation. The resultant terrorism did not help their case any better. The second error had to do with Chinese nationalism. The Hong Kong communists could arouse the pride of the Chinese people by exploiting the British government's genuine mismanagement of an economy for the benefit of the workers, or the fact that the Hong Kong at the time hosted a large number of U.S. servicemen. In light of the Chinese's historic sensitivity about colonialism, this was a missed opportunity. And third, once the Hong Kong communists successfully got the people out onto the streets, they kind of forgot what those people were striking for. Those people just wanted better pay and working conditions, not for their city to turn into a communist paradise like what was happening on the mainland. So when the factory owners and the labor leaders came to an amicable settlement, everyone got back to work. The workers at that particular factory were satiated, but the communists kept pushing until it all fell apart. In starting these riots, the Hong Kong communists thought they could bring change to the colony in the same way change had been brought to Macau. But their actions were misguided and rash and failed to gain support like as with Macau. Mao teaches his revolutionaries to have patience and to constantly organize amongst the people. Hong Kong communists did neither and so ended up being just regular street thugs. In part three, we're going to talk a little bit more about the lasting legacy of 1967, partly how it survived and the reaction from London. All right, thanks everyone.